Our morning text this morning, of course, is a continuation of that summer uh, series that we are doing in 1 Thessalonians. We come to the, the end of chapter 4, and uh, we find ourselves uh, looking at a passage, a text, as it were, uh, that now turns from other areas that we've already uh, looked at, uh, especially in the earlier portions of chapter 4, of Paul encouraging the Thessalonican church, again, a young church, <clears throat> please keep that in mind, a young church, um, probably less than a year old, and Paul had only been with them a few weeks uh, to establish and plant that church on its initial basis. And now he is transitioning from some general topics to end time things. We call it prophetical issues. Uh, the technical term is eschatology. Uh, that's simply, whenever you see a word with ology on the end of it, uh, the, the, you can be guaranteed of two things. Uh, somebody needs to get a life instead of <laughs> writing stuff with big words to try to impress people. That's the first thing that you understand. The second thing is that anything with an ology simply means study of in the li literary world. So, esca means future things or things to come. So, you're looking simply at the study of things to come. That's what eschatology really is. Uh, you know, so, keep that in mind, it's just, and you can add whatever words you wish to. The text before us is considered to be probably uh, the classic uh, and most detailed text concerning what we use as the rapture of the church platform, uh, the, that uh, Christ returned for his bride, the church. But before we kind of start to develop it, because we're not going to get through the passage today, uh, this is something that is of enough concern, enough interest, and enough confusion uh, in inside of Christianity that we need to perhaps slow down somewhat uh, in our covering verses for the sake of covering a large portion to help us understand more completely. So let's stop for a moment uh, here because this is what the context is now going to, transitioning to, uh, is the rapture of the church, the common terminology that we use. A lot of information here. The controversy uh, that is, and just, just a couple points to begin with, you know, before we actually deal with the text or begin to. Uh, the controversy is there's a lot of believers that don't agree uh, on what is meant by the rapture of the church. Uh, they don't agree on who, let alone when or how. Uh, and so forth, everything that's with it you know, that comes, or even if uh, there's a good portion of today's Christianity uh, used in a general sense uh, that doesn't even believe that there is going to be uh, what Scripture speaks of as the rapture, the removal of the bride of Christ okay, at some point in the future. Now, what we need to do uh, before we begin throwing rocks and taking sides with Professor this and Professor that, is spend some time saying, I want to know what God says on the subject. I would just recommend that that is a really good place to start, not just for the rapture, but for any other issue in your life, is what does God say about this? Uh, yeah, much more so than being swayed or biased uh, by... The commentaries of men, uh, you know, there's a lot of good men out there with a lot of good biblical positions, but as Bar Dr. Barnhouse said many years ago, he said, truth comes from scripture, error comes from the pulpit, okay? Uh, you know, not meaning the plexiglass or the wood, obviously, uh, but the fact that men are subject to making mistakes. The Word of God doesn't make mistakes. Our job is to interpret it accurately, you know, in its context, historically, grammatically, and so forth, rather than bringing the personal prejudice 
that oftentimes comes from, well, either denominational bias, perhaps. That's the way you were raised. You were raised Methodist, you were raised Baptist, you were raised uh, Lutheran, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, you know, and, but there's another thing, too, and there's just, you know, a huge amount of rank, poor teaching on these type of subjects. That's all there is, okay? Uh, people start from a platform instead of starting from God's Word. They start with, you know, what they think they know or what they heard Dr. So-and-so, you know, speak on or they read some book or whatever it happens to be. Uh, there's nothing wrong with listening and reading and studying any of those, but all has to be run through the filter of what does God say. Mm -hmm. I really recommend that you start with what God says. That way you don't find yourself off out in the weeds and having to get back on the highway to begin with. Sometimes that's a difficult journey, finding your way back. So what we want to do is take an honest, biblical look at any of these subjects, regardless, whether it's salvation, uh, whether it's eternal life, uh, and heaven, whether it's angelology, uh, does Satan exist, or whether it happens to be the rapture. Okay. Second thing, that eschatology word that I've already mentioned and given you some parameters for, is often considered by many in the church arena as being just too confusing and just too darn hard to understand clearly. You know something? That's baloney. <laughs> it really is. Uh, there's nothing in the scripture, if you're willing to actually read it and understand what the context is and that God meant what he said and said what he meant, that you can't understand, uh, you know, maybe the nuances and the fine points and the stuff that... You know, the two professors sitting down with a magnifying glass and a razor blade, cutting one hair, sticking up out of the book of Revelation. Uh, you know, yeah, I can understand. Uh, but as far as the, the main doctrinal teaching of Scripture, you know, you put your mind to it, pray over it, ask God to reveal it to you and work at it, and it's not too hard. You want to know where this comes from? This is a letter written to a church that Paul preached at for probably somewhere between three and six weeks. And he'd already taught on the subject of the rapture and the second coming of Christ, which are two separate events. And wow, you know, uh, Paul did not think that the idea of prophecy was gonna be too complicated, too hard to understand, or anything else when it came to young, just saved, spiritually immature believers. He was teaching on the whole counsel of God. Yeah. Probably a lesson for a lot of preachers today in a lot of places, it really is, okay? Okay, so some background information. Want some real background information? You notice the title. The title does not say the rapture of the church, okay? I mean, I don't think anybody actually looks at the bullet. You know, but if you did, you would find that that's not the title of the sermon. It may be next week, but it's not this week. This week it's translation. We're not talking about taking the English version of the scripture and translating it into some other language for a different ethnic group. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about moving from one position to another, translating across, translating over. So you get to go, if you choose to follow along, to the book of Genesis, the very fifth chapter, pretty close to the beginning. You know, that, that rather, uh, you know, perhaps full of names and somewhat boring chapter about, and he died, and he died, and he died. You know, this guy begat that guy, he lived a long time, and then he croaked. You know, and he just keeps going on and doing that, and you think, my goodness sake. You know, well, one of the things that you really, and most people miss, 
is the contrast with the exception that's in there. And it is absolutely true, and you need to note that regardless of the length of a lifetime, you know, the normalcy of a man's life ends in his physical death. Okay? Uh, regardless of whether he lived 30 years, 300 years, or 900 some years, as in the case of, you know, say Methuselah, uh, and so forth. Yeah. Is, and he died is the norm because of mankind's rebellion against God in the Garden of Eden and death passed upon all men for that all have sinned, right? Romans 5, 12. And because of that, that just jumps right off the, the pages of chapter 5 and should impress us that man's normal destiny as far as physical life on this earth is going to die, okay? Some earlier than others, some through accident, some through old age, disease, you know, whatever it happens to be, but that's the norm. Except for this anomaly, okay? A guy by the name of Enoch. So in chapter five, uh, five of Genesis, if you run your finger down the page, you know, it says in verse 18 that a guy by the name of Jared, in the midst of this 1,600 years of chronology, okay, uh, a guy by the name of Jared lived to be 162 at when he begat Enoch. That doesn't mean, you know, he goes on and says that he finally, fi he finally croaked at 962 there in verse 19. But we're not talking about Jared except the fact that that's Enoch, you know, was the father, you know, within this thin red line of redemption that carries through this part of human, uh, human, what? Human history, I guess, is the way to put it. Okay? Verse 21, Enoch was 65 years old when he had a son named Methuselah. Okay? And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah for an additional 300 years okay? and had other sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years in the genealogy and the aging of the people recorded here, the guy is just kind of like in his early 20s when he's 365, okay? He's just hitting prime manhood, you know, I mean, uh, everything that goes with it. Can you imagine the family reunions <laughs> in those days, you know? I mean, what you... You know, if you invited the whole family, well, you'd have to rent Texas, you know, just to put up all the picnic tables. Yeah, you really, I mean, yeah. I mean, you stop and think about this. Well, what is significant here is verse 24. Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. And there is no, he's a blatant exception here, he is the, had there is no record, there's no statement, and he died. Completely an anomaly compared to all the other guys that live for eight, nine hundred years and so forth. Okay. It, uh, he was translated. God took him. Okay. That's what it said. Now, he's a fascinating study in himself because you don't have a whole lot of information. You got this stuff and a little bit in, believe it or not, the book of Jude. It talks about the prophecy of Enoch, which we have no record of. We don't know for sure what it was except in the Jude context. Here you have the statement that at 365, and you have to connect, and he walked with God, okay, uh, that God took him. Okay? Uh, the Hebrew phrase is the same one we use in the Greek phrase in the New Testament as translated or carried over, carried away, carried from, carried across. In other words, in Enoch's case specifically, he was carried across death. He never had to physically die. Okay? Yeah, it's pretty significant because even Jesus, you remember, died, obviously, for the sins of the world within God's program. But here you have a guy who somehow please God to a, such a point. That's what walked with God means, being in fellowship with God. 
And he was such a pleasure that God chose him, elected him to be translated across physical death. Wow. You know, all of these other people, you know, 16 centuries of people, and this guy is the exception. He was carried across, carried over death. Now turn over, if you would, there's other examples in the Old Testament you know, that use that particular terminology, but let's go to the New Testament and take a look at Colossians chapter 1, Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians, all kind of piled together there, following the Corinthians. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul relates uh, what his prayer was for the believers in Colossus. And he states, beginning in verse 9 and following, a lot of the particulars that he wanted them to be able to walk worthy of the Lord uh, in wisdom and spiritual understanding, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, giving thanks to the Father who hath made us you know, fit to be partakers of the, you know, qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And then verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. We have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Now we're talking about spiritual status, spiritual place, spiritual position, okay? We have been, uh, the word is methistome in the Greek, and I'm sure everybody will remember that, you know, uh, but the word means literally to carry away, okay? Uh, so you have to be carried from, to be carried away, to be carried out of, to be carried across. In this particular case, in Colossians, he's not talking about physical death being carried over. He's talking about your spiritual eternal position as a believer when you were saved it were taken from the darkness realm to the realm of light. The realm of lost to the realm of saved. Okay, In other words, your eternal destiny at the moment of salvation God carried you he took you from one position, carried you across the penalty of that position, and placed you into eternal life. Okay? It's just simply, that's the way it is. Revelation 3.10 is another passage that deals with this. It says, because you have kept my word with endurance... He said, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation, that's the great tribulation, the trial, the testing that's there, who it shall come upon all the world to test them that dwell upon the earth. He says, I am going to remove you. I'm going to take you out of the what we call the terminal generation of the church. One of these days, we might well be living in it, I don't know, uh, that Christ is going to return for his bride and he is going to remove us from being in a position on this earth and going to place us into a different position because the great tribulation, God's wrath upon disobedient men is going to be poured out for what we call the 70th week of Daniel. All you people that memorized the book of Daniel when we went through it, or the 70 weeks platform, you know, are, you know, have a working knowledge of what that 70th week is. It's a seven year period that is going to come upon the earth. Now, the confusion often comes uh, from other passages of scripture that are taken out of context. Let me give you one example. When it comes to the tribulation, the rapture of the church, often being confused, especially with the second advent of Christ. Go to Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, and the 24th chapter. Okay. Matthew 24. Jesus had been down speaking at the temple. 
And as he departed that day, he paused, turned, apparently, and glanced at the Herodian temple and made the statement within the hearing of the apostles that it would all be destroyed. Okay? It would all be destroyed. Okay? One stone will not be left upon another. This brought up all kinds of questions in the minds of the apostles. When they got him off by himself, they began to ask these questions. What's gonna, when is this going to occur? How is it going to occur? What is going to lead up to this? This Herodian temple took almost 40 years to build okay, on the site of the previous temple. And Christ now is saying it's all going to be destroyed. Wow, that really got their attention. So they said, how's this going to happen? When's it going to happen? What's going to bring this about? What events are going to lead up to this and everything that goes with it? And Jesus goes down through an entire discourse. We were talking about the Jews being concerned about the Jewish temple where they worship God on a national basis. Okay, Keep that in mind because here you are dealing with a often confusion that results from lack of context. Okay? If you drop down in the passage and ignore the context but all through the first part of the chapter, then you come to a passage uh, beginning, for instance, in verse 36. You've got to run your finger down there. The day and the hour no man knows, but the angel of heaven, and not even the angel of heaven, but my father only, as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Stop and pause. The coming of the Son of Man. Okay. What is the context? The Jewish people, the Jewish nation, the Jewish temple, the Jewish worship system. And Christ has stated that he's going to return at some point in the future in all those verses leading up to this point in verse 38. But he says, like the days of Noah, you know, the guy with the big boat and the animals, you know, and all that. Okay, all right, before the flood. He, as the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man. As in those days that were before the flood, mankind, they, we're eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. In other words, they're just going about their regular, everyday, earthly business. You know, the stuff that you do all the time. You go to work, you mow the grass, you split the wood, you take out the garbage, you know, you raise the kids, you know, you throw stuff at the dog, you know, whatever it happens to be. You try to get your, you know, lawnmower back from the neighbor who borrowed it last year and now thinks it's his. You know, that type of stuff. In other words, business life goes on as usual uh, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and were oblivious. I, I'm going to use that term. They knew not until the flood came and drowned them all. They were oblivious to the fact that there was a serious event coming. God was going to judge sinful men in the days of Noah and they were totally oblivious because they were too busy doing their own thing, man. Like, hey, it's cool, you know? I mean, we got mini golf tonight. We can't be bothered going to church. You know, when, you, know you got all these stuff. You know, I mean, it, it, that's the way, you know, it, it, kind of like a, a lot of people are today, isn't it? Okay. It, uh, so he says, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now he's going to give a couple of quick illustrations about this coming of the Son of Man. Then, at Christ's return, please note, quotation marks, underline, capital letters in a different font, in a different, okay, get the idea? Then will two be in a field. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two, King James supplies women, grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. And the huge majority of Christianity says, that's the rapture. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. You know, Matthew doesn't have the church in it. Matthew is about the king and his return to set up his kingdom. 
That's the second coming of Christ. We call it the second advent. This is not the rapture of the church. Okay? The context is Israel, the kingdom that Christ is going to establish when he returns. Just if you don't think so, all you have to do is cross index over to the, and we're not going there, I'll just make a, make a note, and to the very end of Luke 17, you have the parallel passage. It's not recorded in Matthew, but the apostles asked Jesus, where are these people going to be taken, the ones that are taken? And he says they're going to be taken out and killed. Oops. That doesn't sound like the rapture of the church. The church is the bride of Christ. Okay? Believers today from the Pentecost until the rapture are a composite, multi-generational, multi-century group that are, is Christ's bride. You actually think the Son of God, who pleased his Father so much that God resurrected him and completely endorsed him and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God right now, is going to beat the wife of his son? That would make God, the Father, a wife beater, an abuser of the bride of his son. It doesn't work just doesn't fit. The context isn't there. You are talking about the judgment being here, being the, the second advent of Christ when he returns physically to the earth at the battle of Armageddon, defeats the armies of the world gathered against him, puts the beast and the antichrist into the bottomless pit, you know, everything that goes with Revelation 19 and then establishes the millennial kingdom reign, that thousand-year reign that is promised repetitiously throughout the Old Testament, you know, in text after text after text. Okay. That judgment that is here is when he gathers all the physical survivors that have managed to physically stay alive during the 70th week the holocaust of mankind, not just the holocaust of Germany's provision against the Jews in World War II era, you have the holocaust of all holocausts that God brings to completion with the return of his son. With the people that have survived, he gathers, Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats. Mm -hmm. And the sheep... Say, he tells them, blessed are you, come inherit the kingdom prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. But how about the goats? The goats, he says, you are going to hell because you have rejected the gospel of my son. Okay? Physically, at that moment, they are taken out, according to Luke, and killed. So when you read Matthew, and this is just one illustration, you, or any text, you need to understand context. I know I've had people tell me for years, you know, you know if the, when they bury you, that's what they're going to put on the tombstone. <laughs> Hayden, context, context, context. You know, there's a huge amount of confusion that comes if you look just at Matthew 24, where it talks about two in the field and one taken, two at the mill and one taken, and you scream, rapture of the church. No, it isn't. He's not talking about the church. He's talking about the time of what? He says, already said it, but we miss it. He says, at the coming of the Son of Man at his return to earth at the second advent to set up his kingdom because you remember what the questions were. When are you coming back to set up your kingdom? When are you coming to complete the promises you made about a kingdom for the nation of Israel with you being its king? When are you going to reestablish? When are you going to rebuild the temple, etc., etc., etc.? All that's inherent in the questioning in the first part of the chapter. What you find here is, are you ready for another one? 
this is kind of an aside. Uh, it, if you go up a few verses, verse 34, I'm going to talk about context. Pay attention. This one is misunderstood even more. This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And people are totally confused with that because they don't understand the context. He says, when these things, got to go back earlier, the beginning of sorrows, verse 8 and following, the, the abomination that makes desolate, that's in the middle of Daniel's 70th week, the return to great tribulation mentioned here in verses 21 and 2, everything that deals with that, and then the sign of the Son of Man in heaven coming upon all the tribes of the earth and Christ coming in glory, returning to the Mount of Olives. We know where he's coming back because that's what he said. You know, the angel, remember when Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives, said you're going to see him come right back down one of these days. Okay? But the rapture of the church spoken of in 1 Thessalonians, Christ never returns to the earth. He stops in the air. The Greek terminology and even the English translation you know, specifically makes a point of that's different than him coming down and his feet landing on the Mount of Olives at the peak of the Battle of Armageddon. Two separate events. Okay? What do people do with this? This generation shall not pass. They say, well... So the generation that was alive in A.D. 32 when Christ died on the cross, uh, you know, the, the, you know, and you can just see the confusion just comes bubbling out. Because they think, well, it must be a referral to the Roman general Titus sacking Jerusalem in A.D. 70. No. Huh? No, 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 no. No, it's not at all. What's he dealing with here? He said, the generation that's alive, when these events begin to unfold, that generation is going to live through, what, seven years? Yeah. Eh? Eh? That generation of mankind is going to participate in the seven-year wrath of God that is poured upon the earth, that is brought to completion at the time of Christ's second coming. Eh? And you say, so where's the church? Perfect vernacular. It ain't in there. Eh? You got to go to places like 1 Thessalonians to find out about the church. The church is not in Matthew 24. Eh? He's talking about the Jews, their temple, their kingdom, their king. Okay? We are talking about our husband, our savior, our redeemer. We've got a whole different relationship. Okay? By the way, you will never find the term. Okay? You want trivia that is significant? I'll give you one. You will never find the term in Christ. Okay? Familiar with it? Okay? All over in the New Testament, in the epistles. You will never find that term used anywhere in the Old Testament. You'll never find it used in the Gospels. Okay? The term in Christ only applies and specifically applies to the church age believer. That is because it designates a specific relationship. Okay? We are the bride of Christ. Old Testament believers, they're the wife of Jehovah. We're not. We're the bride of Christ. There's a whole different relationship with the tribulation saints and with the millennial kingdom saints doesn't make anybody better or more spiritual than any other group. It just says you're distinct. Okay? Look around. See the person alongside of you? They're just as big a sinner as you are. Okay? But there's a difference between saved sinful people and unsaved sinful people. Okay? Hopefully, as Steve was trying to beat through our thick skulls in Sunday school, there will be a progressive movement towards Christ-likeness and a God-honoring life as we go through the process. But you see where, what happens and how it goes. The Thessalonican context, and I'll just give you this to close with, and you think, wow, we didn't get very far in 1 Thessalonians. Well, I told you we weren't going to do the whole thing. 
Come on, give me a break. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul writes this. I would not, verse 13, okay, the start of this text that we're looking at. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others who have no hope. Okay? You know, people harp on this. And the term asleep, by the way, has to do with the Christian's physical death, the believer's physical death. Okay? Occasionally you run into rather strange teaching on it has to do with soul sleep. Yeah, how many of you have heard that at some point? Okay. You know that's completely non-biblical? There's no such thing as soul sleep. It's not mentioned anywhere in Scripture. Okay. Being asleep means that physically you have died. What did Paul say? To be absent from the body is to be asleep with the soul? No. To be present with the Lord. Yeah, the soul, spirit, consciousness at the instant of physical termination goes to be as a believer with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Okay. What you are dealing with here is Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant. That's really a polite way of saying you're dumber than rocks. Now, it, uh, that's a Hayden paraphrase, obviously. It, now, the, don't get me wrong. There is nothing wrong with being ignorant on spiritual issues in and of itself. As a brand new believer, you and I were all spiritually ignorant on just about any and everything found in the Bible, except we knew that somehow, for some reason, God loved us. Yeah, that's all we knew. But to remain ignorant I will tell you, not that is a problem, it's sinful. Okay? Paul addressed this. Steve mentioned it again in Sunday school, you know, in kind of a different venue. Uh, but to remain on milk, to remain on pablum instead of moving on to strong meat, and that's wrong. That's weird. That is, that's not normal. That's not the right thing to do. I mean, we all realize that if we run into somebody who has a 30-year-old child that still can't talk clearly and has to wear a diaper and can't crawl, that that's, there's something seriously wrong here because a child, you bring them home and they're squiggling and <coughs> stuff is coming out of both ends, you know, and you got to figure out how you handle this thing. But you expect at some point that kid is going to be able to sit up. And then he's going to be able to toddle. And he's going to start feeding himself. I mean, generously, kind of smear it around and hope it oozes in somehow. You know, but at some point, they're almost, maybe by the time they're like 25 or 30, they're almost ready to be presented out there to society at large. You know, there's some of you, I'm not sure that you still have made the cut, you know, but some of you think that about me as well. Yeah, but there's supposed to be a progressive maturity that takes place, isn't there? Yeah, but we started out babes. The problem isn't starting out a babe, the starting is remaining a babe. Paul began teaching eschatology right off the bat. He was there for that few weeks time and he'd already spoken of these things because he uses the term, you remember when I was with you, I taught you about this stuff. Now, there were some particulars that apparently he had not taught on. And that's the context of what's going on here in verse 13 and following. He said, you are ignorant of what happens when a believer physically dies, because we're going to find out Paul understood what we call the doctrine of imminency, that Christ could come back for his church to rapture them out in this air meeting at any moment. Nothing had to occur first. 
Folks, that's not true with the second coming. There is a whole list of things that have to take place within that 70th week of Daniel that we see in the book of Revelation, chapter 6 through 19, before Christ comes back to the earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and initiates the thousand-year reign. Not so with the church. Doctrine of imminency says that can occur at any moment. Okay? Might be before I finish the next sentence. Before this day is over, whatever it happens to be. You know, when God's program for his son's bride is complete here on this earth, he's going to take us out of here. We're going to be translated. Okay? We're going to be the terminal generation. And boy, is there a huge amount of information that we're going to glean from this text. Let's pray. Father, thank you. As we begin to unfold the reality of our future destiny, what's going to happen to us, and whether we're physically, our tabernacle is in the grave or not, our tent, our earthly uh, shroud that we wear while here on this earth, uh, is in the grave or it's maybe we are part of the generation that will go up and meet in the clouds without dying, that we will be carried over that particular thing. But spiritually, we've already been translated as believers from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. As we pursue this, we pray, Lord, for your wisdom. We pray to be able to glean the reality of the specialness of who you have made us in Christ. In his name we pray, amen.